Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is Brian Kazaska. And Ben, today is the day we start off. Twin Peaks Unwrapped presents the best of Twin Peaks in 2022. And where's Scott? Uh, you know, that's a good question. You know, I reached out to uh He's Scott. given up on us. He's given up on us. You know, we had so many good shows with him, and I thank him so much for all these years of, like, were we calling it the best of? We've always called it that, right? Or, I don't know, whatever the special yeah. was, Scott made it extra special with him coming up, you and him coming up with these different crazy ideas, and uh, it's been fun. Now that we're retired and just do these specials, it's it's back to us. Uh, you know, it's funny you say this. I reach out to Scott. I sent him an email. And every year, this is a little behind the curtains for everybody. Every year I send him an email saying, here's our plan. This is my idea. And then he scraps my entire idea and he goes, I got a better <laughs> one. No joke. We could probably do the ideas I had because they were never done. And there you go. But, but Scott's ideas were always good and we had a great time and we do miss him this year. But Scott will be joining us on the show a little bit later on with a clip from his book. Nice. Also, I, I'm going to tease this. Part two will be airing January 2nd, and part two might have some unheard audio. Ooh. Yes, of our interview, or I should say Scott's interview, <clears throat> with Kimberly Don't Nicole. Don't tell anymore. Oh. Don't even say anything. All right, all right, all right. Well, keep, we'll hush on that. But we have a packed episode today, Ben. Uh, we're going to end the show off with you talking a little bit more about your your trip to Florida. Nice. The spooky Empire Con there. Yeah. So that should be a lot of fun. So we're going to start off our best of episode. In the very beginning of the year, we had David Bushman and, and Mark Gibbons on. And they talked about their brand new book, Murder at Hills Pond, Hazel Drew and the Mystery That Inspired Twin Peaks, um, which is really cool. It's so interesting that this year was a very big year for books in the Twin mm. Peaks world. Friends, right? uh, friends of ours writing books related to Twin Peaks in some ways. I mean, yeah. I consider this, I know they would say it, uh, Murder at Teal Pond is not a Twin Peaks book, but it definitely is what inspired Mark Frost, hearing stories from his grandmother, that inspired him to kind of come up with Laura Palmer. Yeah, totally. So we're going to play a clip from that podcast that aired at the beginning of the year. And afterwards, you're going to hear a clip from our friends at Blue Rose Task Force podcast, John Bernardi and producer Mitch. We will be right back after that. <laughs> Two of our uh, favorite people in the world, David Bushman, and Mark Evans wrote a great book, Murder at Teal's Pond, and we figured, hey, we should have them on the show. And this is like years in the making. I mean, I've been hearing about this book for, for <laughs> a long time, so I'm so excited that we, we get to read this, and now we get to talk about it, and this is so great. Thank you guys for coming on the show. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. guys. Congratulations on having the book on January's pick for Oxygen's Book Club. Uh, How did you guys find out about that and i had no idea oxygen had a book club so how, <laughs> how did that all happen for you guys our publisher is thomas and mercer and they um they have in-house publicity and they also have um they also hire um at least for us they did they hired an outside contractor with a company called dandelion um a woman named uh, courtney who had they've been great and they've gotten us mm. you know a lot of um a lot of attention and a lot of uh, interviews um and they got i think it was kristen at uh, thomas and mercer who got the oxygen book club uh gig i guess for us which yeah was a was a great thing for us we did an interview with them um recently and that went really well and um that is really exciting news yeah 
Nice. Yeah. I didn't know they had a book club either, but now I do. That's awesome. It's so awesome. Uh, yeah. So congratulations again. That's really, that's an accomplishment. To be on a book club's list of any, you know, that's great. Right. Yeah. I'd love to start this off kind of like kind of seeing how you guys got together and, and came out with this book. But starting off with, you know, way back in March 23rd, 2016, the first time I had heard about Hazel Drew was from Mark's podcast, Dear Metal Radio. <laughs> and you had, I don't think I remember hearing anything about that, but you decided to put, put a show together just on Hazel Drew. And first of all, you know, Mark Frost, it didn't call her Hazel Drew, it was Hazel Gray. So you, you, Mark, you want to briefly talk about that and maybe kind of go from there and talk about how it, we got to the book. Yeah, you're right. So just, we were talking about uh, a little bit uh, before the air, it's almost five years since the return. That's kind of what got us all, uh, all of us, I think, kind of going in this business or whatever mm -hmm. we're doing here. Um, but yeah, I was doing uh, Dear Meadow Radio uh, in anticipation of the new season of Twin Peaks and digging around looking for things to, uh, you know, kind of uncover things that hadn't maybe been discussed. And with Twin Peaks, so much of it over the years had been, you know, really covered. But I think when we came back, what we had that they, we didn't have back in the 90s for at that period was the, you know, the internet. We were able mm. to kind of make all these other connections. Back in the day, you had wrapped in plastic and, you know, that was about it. Maybe some basic primitive news groups, I guess, at the time also. Um, but yeah, looking at uh, the origins of Twin Peaks, I was kind of, you know, looking through the, the traditional analysis. The you were trying to get into the pilot, I the think. The pilot, yeah, that's was what it was. I was the pilot. Well, I had a big plan, you know, I was gonna systematically go through everything. We got through the pilot, <laughs> I guess. I don't know how much farther we got. But yeah, looking for um, inspirations, uh, the origins behind uh, the pilot, and looking at things like their past where Frost had done um, a movie. What was that movie? The Believer is not too mm. long before that. Lynch had done Blue Velvet, both, you know, kind of tied into Twin Peaks in a way. But yeah, the one thing that um, was kind of unique that, you know, made me, made my eyes jump open. And, and you know, in parallel, David was kind of working on a book, Twin Peaks FAQ, in a similar way, looking in, you know, unexplored areas, explored areas, unexplored areas. And we both kind of saw Frost, it was, there were two or three actually uh, looking around uh, references to this, like you said, Hazel Gray, um, but very little um, information um, associated with it in the interview. You know, there wasn't any like follow up or anything. Um, I think um, most of these were, I'm not sure now. Oh, the, uh, it was the 25th uh, anniversary of the USC retrospective was sort of a notable one um, where he, he, he referenced this, um, but they just kind of, you know, kept on. It might've been, and it was referenced once or twice over the years as well. For the podcast, I, I really wanted to find out if this was a true story. The way Frost talked about it was, it was kind of like a ghost story, something his uh, grandmother had told him to kind of scare him and stay out of the woods. And I spent a weekend for the podcast. And this is back on, you know, Knee Deep in Deer Meadow Radio, um, just on the internet, using what little facts that Frost had provided to, to see if I could find a real case that had occurred 100 years ago around this time frame. And the, the big key, like you alluded to, was uh, that Frost had got the name wrong. It was not mm. Hazel Gray, it was Hazel Drew. And so the way I came upon that was I just, I kept the Hazel in the search engine, took out the, the Drew, um, and then all of a sudden, with those other facts, all of a sudden, now I'm finding actual newspaper articles, and there was there was a plethora. Uh, so that's kind of how I got started. And hey, Ron, I just want to say, it was funny, like, yeah. on the podcast, you said, it wasn't like there was a book about this murder that you could just <laughs> open up and read. You had to find these articles and put them together. But it's funny to be, like, to start off saying, hey, there's no book, and then you and David come together and make, make a book. That is funny. I remember also saying at the time, because I, I just started looking into this, you know, I was supposed to be looking into Twin Peaks and was gonna get to episode one and two and, you know, kind of keep going like that. I do remember another quote that this is gonna turn into the, the Hazel Drew podcast, which, you know, in, in a sense, with the twist and the turns, that's what happened there, so yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna keep throwing things at you guys, but like, yeah. it's so funny that like, so the summer of the great, uh, the summer of 2016, it was the Great Southern Twin Peaks Festival in Richmond, Virginia, and you guys were both there <laughs> and, I ran into Mark on the street and he's like, hey, how you doing? I mean, we met each other because we've done, you know, we did the podcast, but we never saw each other in person. We say hi and then Mark is gone. I don't think you actually saw David when he was there, were you? You didn't see, were you? I didn't, I didn't speak to him. I didn't yeah. speak to him. What happened was I, I, I went to, uh, 
a panel. I think you got, I think David was with his book at the time. So yeah. I, I did listen in on his panel. But what happened then, I think shortly after we met, is I, I noticed my um, wedding ring was missing. Yeah. Very Twin yeah. Peaks. And I spent, you know, the next 12 hours or whatever it was trying to find which I never did. So yeah, that's why I kind of disappeared from all the festivities. <laughs> I, I, I just think that and, that's, uh, that's perfect because if I could count all the times that Mark left something behind, <laughs> <laughs> we were going from place A to place B, usually his computer, but I think his wallet at one time. Oh, and man. So many things to keep, you know, <laughs> so many things. It's, that reminds me of me and Ben. How many times Ben would show up for the record? Be like, I forgot my earbuds. I dropped yep. them somewhere. Yeah, I forgot my computer. Like, I, he would I'm, be I'm always, mess. yeah, yes, yeah. She kind of like teenage daughters, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and David, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself. Do you want to briefly say what is your book? I mean, I, I just assume everybody already knows what we're talking about. Maybe you want to briefly say what is your book about? Uh, yeah, Murder at Kills Pond is about the um, 1908 murder of hazel drew which mark just referenced mark givens just referenced and um it was one of two real uh crimes that influenced mark frost when he uh wrote the laura palmer arc or when he was conceiving the laura palmer arc of um of twin peaks the original twin peaks and so and he says that he's mentioned he mentioned it to david lynch but he doesn't think lynch remembered it so we're talking about mark frost here not not david lynch who has his own obsessions and so it was an unsolved murder. She was a governess, I'm sorry, not a governess, but a homemaker or a domestic servant, they called it back in, in the day. Mm -hmm. And um, she lived in Troy and worked for some of the most pe powerful people in the city. And um, one day she disappeared and they found her body, what, four days later, Mark, in, in a pond, which is again, you know, sort of evocative mm -hmm. of Laura. They went about, you know, trying to figure out who who had killed her, what she was doing there. There's tons of mis mysterious questions, and um, you know, Mark Givens and I kind of spent five years trying to get to the bottom of it as as best we could. Uh, you know, Mark Frost was really helpful to us. He he, um, we interviewed him for a piece on um, that ran in the Washington Post uh, around the return, the premiere of the return about Hazel and. Um, he also wrote the forward to this book. I guys. hope you guys are, are so proud. You guys are always so, uh, you know, just very calm and collected, but you guys have done amazing work. I mean, this stuff you guys should be so proud of. I mean, five years and it really is such a tight book. I mean, it really yeah. is a solid tight book that, I mean, I'm just so impressed by what you guys were able to accomplish in this. Cool cover too, right? Isn't that yes. cover? Yeah, so cool. So awesome. <laughs> I'm looking at it. Yeah. It's really wild. Thank you. Thank you Thank so God. much. Hi, Ben and Brian. It's John Bernardi, and uh, thanks for including Blue Rose Task Force podcast in this episode. We totally appreciate it. Blue Rose Task Force podcast is a full spoilers podcast, and it uses the recap formula, but cross-referencing, you know, everything that'll happen anywhere within the scope of Twin Peaks. You know, if it has relevance to whatever part of Twin Peaks I'm looking at currently... I'll be looking at that too. Nothing is off limits to discuss, which is, you know, something that I've appreciated in shows like Sparkwood and 21 before season three came out. But um, no show was really doing this since season three came out. And, uh, you know, I gave people plenty of time to do it. So, uh, yeah, this is your own fault, people, that I'm <laughs> that I'm doing Blue Rose Task Force podcast. Um, anyway, it goes chronologically in order of release, and it includes the books, and it even includes the Diane audio tapes. And honestly, these first couple of entries make me believe why he might not like Sam Stanley. Because, uh, um, you know, Cooper here is always talking about particulars. You know, he's, uh, you know, how much is it? How, uh, how many things? You know, it's like, what exactly is on his plate? What is, uh, you know, like, how many exact breakfast options are there? Everything is itemized. And um, it's... It's a lot like how, you know, Sam goes into the Deer Meadow office and, you know, says, you know, I've, I've calculated this whole, this whole entire office costs less than $27,000 or, you know, like whatever he did. Um, it's very similar to how Cooper thinks. So I kind of wonder, does Cooper not like Sam because, you know, self-recognition fuels the dislike? Oh, just, uh, 
Absolutely nothing intentional, but it's kind of a neat touch uh, looking back from the future. I initially started off the show with a co-host, but, you know, life changes for people, and Elle had to reduce her role, but we still make sure that Elle has a chance to share her thoughts when she can. And when she does come back, she brings it. In cinema and TV, we've seen a lot of dissociative identity disorder and schizophrenia, which has been demonized. Um, but actually, it's often narcissists who are the perpetrators of abuse and familial abuse as they are kind of a modern day vampire. They essentially live on narcissistic supply, which is other people's identities, other people's life force, and often trauma that they create in other people to act out their own childhood trauma because they're in hell themselves. They're in an absolute state of selflessness. They have no self to grasp onto. And this is what poses this, this main question in psycho-spiritual drama that is Twin Peaks and specifically this arc is that is it evil that he made a choice is it a demon or is it mental illness or is there some kind of blurring of whatever that is can we ever know each episode of Blue Rose Task Force podcast starts with a look into the production history because I think it's important to look at all the factors around a show when it was being made, too. You know, it helps explain the story choices, why they might have happened the way they did, and, you know, to explain any context of the culture around it as well. That pretty much leads us into the next Audrey Cooper storyline. This was before, you know, the early 2000s when um, characters on film were doing things like, you know, dealing with their trauma in a realistic kind of way. Um, you know, it's like Twin Peaks was didn't need to go into the ramifications of what happened to Leland because, you know, I mean, Twin Peaks had already told that kind of story. And I don't think viewers of the day would have really taken to it anyway. I mean, some would have, but, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, man, you told this story. Oh, I got to do something different with this. But, you know, I mean, not to mention that would require a ton of continuity to remember still uh, from a bunch of people that are already lost. So, you know. You, you still get the if you miss an episode you may as well stop watching vibe so um and you know i mean honestly also the staff needed a break because as uh, you know twin peaks behind the scenes put it the laura palmer storyline had become an albatross to the staff so you know it's like they needed a break too from all the pressure and you know they it's it's kind of like giving everybody a fresh start here and yeah i mean hence it you know turns into burying all the darkness so that um they could pave a way for a romance arc. And, um, you know, Sherilyn Finn, she was all for this romance arc because, you know, she had no problem being at the center of the next pivotal storyline. Uh, you know, and uh, Harley Payton, the writer, he was also for it. But um, it's uh, it's Kyle McLaughlin who didn't want it. After looking at the production history, I'll explore any relevant connective tissue, you know, like the Log Lady introductions. And then it's time to dig deep into the lore, the themes, and uh, trying to square any connective elements that make the original show that aired on ABC, Fire Walk With Me, and the limited series that aired on Showtime to be all part of the same whole. And, you know, as Bob is pulling Maddie toward the door frame, um, the, the lighting shifts and, you know, we get Leland instead of Bob. And, you know, he's the one who actually pulls Maddie into the room where she's going to be killed. The, the lighting and the sounds are all normal physical world stuff at this point, And it stays that way on Leland until he lands a punch on Maddie. And I gotta say that I fine tooth combed this scene and it's Leland who lands every blow. He does all of the physical damage. He's the one who brings her into the room. He's the one who punches every time. You know, even even if he's speaking as Bob, even if we see um, later, you know, Bob following through on punches, like we never actually see Bob doing it. I kind of think this is code that Lynch is throwing in, that he is acknowledging Leland's culpability here, even though we're talking about evil spirit. Um, you know, this is where we get Leland breaking down, kind of like Bill Hastings does in, uh, what what is it, part 11 of season three? 
You know, it's like the, uh, also the same way that Leland breaks down in Fire Walk with me when Bob seems to leave Leland for a bit and Leland goes into Laura's room broken and apologetic. Uh, it's it's one of those scenes at night where, um, you know, that, that scene, he's different enough that even Laura can seem to tell that this is her actual father. Um, so does, does Leland see all the bad things as like these strange dreams that he doesn't want to completely acknowledge kind of like how bill hastings you know sure he works with kids he has a side thing with a librarian uh you know they, they have a fun hobby together but um you know then they're enlisted by the major and they're caught up in this danger but you know he loses time he doesn't realize that you know it took a whole bunch of time between when he uh dropped Ruth off, quote unquote, and uh, got back home to his house. And, you know, it's just a dream, right? You know, L Ruth didn't actually die then, right? But she did. So when you have to throw out a romance subplot that's kind of anchoring the tone of this episode, what do you do? Where do you go? You know, the, the show was moving at the speed of television and it needed to be made in a specific time and it was probably already running late by the time they finished it. So they had to kind of make make moves on the fly quickly you know but where where do they find the new storyline um well it's in the same previous material where the audrey and cooper romance would have come from it's it they they decided to go with one-eyed jacks as its root you know instead of audrey audrey's tormentor john renault who you know who who um already had a grudge against cooper and um in, again, in conversations with Mark Frost, uh, Frost said, but the upshot of it was that we had to advance the Wyndham Earl story faster than we planned and come up with the Michael Park storyline as the dominant narrative of that arc over the next three episodes, which also brought Duchovny's character into the show. All those details right there, you know, we and anybody who's still lamenting the, uh, the Audrey Cooper romance that never was, we actually got Denise Bryson from it. So uh, not not a terrible trade. Now, while I want to get a grasp of how reality seems to work within the episodes of Twin Peaks, I hope also to help people who like some parts of Twin Peaks, but not all of them, you know, the, the ones who uh, can't get into the movie or, you know, season three isn't their Twin Peaks or, you know, maybe, maybe you know, these people skip parts of Twin Peaks uh, season <laughs> and maybe these uh, folks start skipping parts of season two, too. You know, it's like I'd, I'd like to point at how every single piece of Twin Peaks is part of a whole and how they all have the same foundation at its root, no matter when it was made. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe folks will come around and see why all parts of Twin Peaks are worth it. Thanks again, Ben and Brian, for letting uh, Blue Rose Task Force podcast stretch its legs here and show your audience a little bit more about what we do. And, um, you know, thanks from me. Thanks from L. Thanks from our producer, Mitch, over at Ruminations Radio Network. Uh, you know, thanks, everybody. And um, we appreciate your work. And, um, yeah, take care and happy holidays. Thank you, Blue Rose Task Force Podcast. Uh, John Bernardi, I love this. It's a great podcast. It's been, I mean, for so long, I thought John should be doing a podcast because he's, right. I mean, he's got so much knowledge and he's so interesting and funny. And, and he's always telling us how we could do our podcast better. So now he gets to live it and, 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 and make his own show. So He does a fantastic job and producer Mitch. Uh, the show sounds great. We do appreciate the fact that you guys took the time to produce and give us a 10 minute clip. That is very nice of you guys. Thank you. And it's a highlight, highlight of the year. Go subscribe to them today. And you remember John Bernardi was on our April Fool's show, which was all based on yes. the TV show Lost, which it was great to have my son Seth on too. But what a fun, uh, you know, we've been talking for years about wanting to, to, to have, we were going to do our own podcast based on loss. What was it? Was it for our, for when we turned 50? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which, you know, we had, none of us had turned 50 yet. We were no, both we're not that 40s. old yet. Not that old yet. And it was great because we had this idea. And the year before I was like, Ben, if we have done this April Fool's Day joke where we changed all our social media stuff to loss <laughs> and then we did it. 
That was great. It, it pulled was it great. off. You got the right. Annie Bentley made us new graphics for our lost podcast. And what a nice touch that was too. It was yes. so fun to it, that was a really fun thing to plan. I know I think Brian, Brian, you came up with a lot of it and planned it out. And I think that was just it, it was so much fun to do. I know we still talk about wouldn't it be fun to do some more, but you know, it was just a it, it was a good one off there for April Fools. Right. We had a great time. And it's funny because Lost actually, Ben, if we, we want to go back, I think Lost, we bonded over Lost uh, yeah. at the very beginning. Right. When we, yeah, when we uh, would see each other, we'd talk about Lost. We went to a movie theater because there was a Q&A special on yeah. Lost. And so, yeah, that was, uh, we. I, I knew I knew when you liked Lost that you had good taste and that we would <laughs> clearly be <laughs> friends and we could talk about other things besides lost like twin peaks yeah, right good taste. yeah you know, talking about lost lost highways 25th anniversary was uh this year uh my favorite david lynch film and uh you know we got to go to uh a theater nearby not far from us to see a remastered mm -hmm. uh lost highway we did we got to go with i think lost highway we saw with fred joel and Andy, right? Yeah, right. And then we got so to crazy. see the Inland Empire with Joel and Andy as well. Yeah, we, a couple. So David Lynch just had two, I think, remastered films, and we got to see them in the same theater with some friends this year. That was pretty cool. And I was so disappointed that they didn't do the 30th anniversary of Firewalk with me. Yeah, missed opportunity. Come on. Big time, big time. I know none of the theaters. We were looking... For theaters in the area, and I didn't see there was very few of any in the country that were doing that. Unfortunately, I guess we're gonna have to wait for the thirty fifth or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unfortunately, but I do want to say that that was something special about this year that you and me we actually saw each other for the very first time after since... the pandemic. Two years was it? It was yes. two years for you and I. Yeah, we oh. saw each other. No joke. Yep, the very last time was in 2020, our book came out. I went to your work with, we got the books, we took a photo, I went home, and then I don't think we saw each other again. No, that's not correct. No? I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened. We were right. close. Maybe you're right, but I'll tell you my version of the story. For sure. But you might be right now that I think about it. So I, you you can correct me. All right. We were doing our show still in the studio. Uh-huh. And I want to say it was March 12th that we did our show. And the very next day, uh, March 13th, they were closing my work. Oh, okay. I so feel we, like I right. feel like we were like, you know, they were like, oh, don't touch other people and wash your hands a lot and get a lot of toilet paper. Yeah. And we were still meeting the day before they started shutting down, things down. Okay, Unless, you're, you're right. We Our book came out early. Right. We got well, it, it was together. still probably within a few days yes. or so that we yeah. you brought, that was so cool that you brought the book all, all you got all the books from Scott from the mail. Right. Brought them in and that was so cool. And I feel like that was close to when we were closing, but I feel like we met I could be wrong, but I feel like we met in the studio and then the next day You're right. We were in the studio. We recorded our last session and the person working in the studio said we're closing. Mm. And I think I went to work that week, and then we then we were told we're closing for two weeks. Yeah, I, I um, think that was. A, I don't even think I went back to work. I think that was. I even may have been told that day that we are not coming back, and I still went and met with you or something. Yes, like that. you're right. You're absolutely and right. I was kidding, and this is not something to be kidding around with. But it's like, oh, you know, it'll be like a week or something. Like yeah. I was thinking that, like, oh, this thing's gonna pass in a week or two. Like I really thought that. I really thought it's like, oh, you know. I guess I'll, I'll be out of work for a week or two. And then two years later, <laughs> two years later, uh, uh, and then, it was very special. It was so special. Yeah. We saw in, Inland Empire in the theaters, the first time seeing each other in two years or so. Right. So that, that was something awesome. Yeah, it was. It was great. And we saw Andy got to go and Joel drove down. So it was so cool that we have some people that we're friends with that can join us. And I'm hoping this theater does more in 2023 that we can get together with our friends. I mean, we, I mean, we, it's, the great thing is that it's an independent theater. Uh, it plays a lot of, uh, yeah, indie type type of movies. I bet we could ask them too to say, "Hey, we want some other Lynch, Lynch works or something like that." Or maybe who knows? Maybe we could find a way to get some Twin Peaks played there. That would be awesome. I bet you we could we could we could figure something out. But because it was the 30th anniversary of Firewalk with me. Our friend Scott Ryan did write a book called Firewalk with Me, Your Laura Disappeared. And 
if I have to say one of my favorite books of the year was this book. I think it's Scott's best work. I mean, I yeah. you know I'm I was kidding with Scott that I like he he, he I should I should have like a retainer or some kind of thing where he just takes my money like at maybe every few months or something because it seems like every book he puts out I, I seem to be getting from him. Even his non Lynch Twin Peaks book, I think I got one on writing and stuff like that. So having read all his other books, I really think this is his best work. I think it's his most personal work. I think it's something that he, he was, you know, he was, he was open about how, how he felt about, about the film and about his own life. And I, yeah, I just love it. I think he did a great job with it. Ben, you said it all. There's nothing I can say. Uh, everything you said, hundred percent. And then after this clip, we're going to go into Emily Marinelli's Twin Peaks Tattoo Podcast. And it's a fantastic podcast. She puts it out once a month. The guests uh, come on. They talk about their relationship with Twin Peaks through Twin Peaks-related tattoos. I think just recently she had on the owners of Tweets. Hmm, the uh, cafe. The, yeah. The double R. The double R. It's a fantastic episode. I learned they have an online presence. You can buy merchandise. You can actually order pies, Ben, and have them uh -huh. delivered to your house. Ooh. Um, I know. So definitely go listen to this po uh, her podcast. Hit subscribe because it's amazing. You'll learn a lot. And like I said, I now I want to order a pie from them. You know, do you remember holidays. that we would uh, remember usually for these shows we would do back in the day? I would bring in a pie, or we would have some kind. Of, this is like our special end of the year type thing. So, yeah, if I had known, if you had told me ahead of time, Brian, <laughs> I would have sent you a pie, and I would have had a pie, and we could have been eating pie together oh. while we were doing this show. Oh next my year. god! Make a note of this. Next year, we get some pies from the calf there. You know, from Tweety's. yes, we're definitely getting a pie from them for our holiday show. Absolutely right, Ben. I do miss those days. Let's hope that 2023 is a better year and we can get, we can record in person again. I like um, that. So here is Scott Ryan with Firewalk With Me. Your Laura disappeared, followed by Emily's podcast, Twin Peaks Tattoo Podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Scott, he's coming right. <laughs> Yay. Uh, because I thought it was weird that you started that way because you actually made me sit in between you as, as a Twin Peaks unwrap sandwich. <laughs> and I don't have a lot of room. We're a little closer than I think. It, so that's why I got a little, I feel a little well, strange. Really I'm the baloney in this sandwich. Yeah, you're like, where, where do I go? Scott Ryan, I mean, you are known for the Blue Rose magazine. You've done, um, uh, what is it that you did that, the Fest of the Twin Peaks Festival documentary. You've done, uh, of course, the Red Room podcast and, uh, and so much more. And uh, you're a good friend of ours. And we, you know, we've been thankful to be able to put our book, you know, in, in, that you published, you know, out to the world. And thank you. And, but you've got something happening now. You've got a new book. Uh, it's based on Fire Walk With Me film. And I can't believe this, that you have never done a Twin Peaks book before because it seems like you would have by now. But it's Fire Walk With Me, Your Lore Disappeared. Yeah, it is crazy because a couple years ago, I was very much into my Letterman promotion. And I was lucky enough to be out in New York City um, interviewing some Letterman people. And I was saying how I was doing this book and they were sort of getting my background and, and I, I talked about Twin Peaks and because they asked, what is your next book going to be? And I said, I, I don't know. And they said, well, what are you doing? And they said, you got to do a Twin Peaks book. That's your brand. And I said, I don't want to do a Twin Peaks book. I just, I got nothing to say. And then it was sneaking up the 30th anniversary. It, I mean... And this book just sort of came to me. I thought, if I got to do one, because everybody's got one, yeah. Ben and Brian has one, Brad Dukes <laughs> has one, Josh Minton has one, John Thorne has one, Courtney Stallings has one, David Bushman has one. I want All of our friends. Good. You're the only one. You're the only one of our friends that doesn't have a book. Yeah. So I was like, fire walk with me. That is, that was the place for me to do it. Um, and... 
that was my only idea that the 30th was coming. I did not know what I would write every single day that I wrote. I did not know what I was going to write. There was no plan for this book, no outline, nothing. It was a very strange book for me. And I have no idea what the fan community is going to think about it. And the two of you are only the fourth people to ever read the book. Wow. Being Bushman. Cool. Um, Lindsay Hallam, who interviewed me for the Red Room, and now you guys. So I just don't know. So I know I'm here to answer questions, but I have a question for you guys. As deep dive fans, what did you guys think of the book? I finished it yesterday. And like I, I texted you, uh, Scott, I was just like, I don't really have words to kind of comprehend how I feel about this book. Like I, I could just say generic things to you, but I was like, I felt like it was a journey. I went on a journey with you and because I know you, your voice was in my head the whole time. And I felt like we were back when we first met and you were debating with Bushman about during breakfast. And I felt like you were sitting across the table from me, just telling me your story. That's what I felt like for me. And I thought it was, it was very Scott. And I think that's why I liked it. You had your humor. You got personal with with things. You you really put your your heart on your sleeve with this one. I thought, and I mean, I I, I don't have words other than to say I really really loved it, and I think the community will find something new from this book. There's a lot of new interesting things that I never heard before, and um, I I think it's just a fantastic book. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree 100% with everything you're saying, Brian. And I was a longtime fan of Twin Peaks back from when it was, you know, originally aired, seeing the movie when it was in theaters. Uh, I was so happy that I feel like you touched on everything that I would be interested in, everything I would want to read about or I would want to make sure would be in a, a Fire Welcome Me book you touched on. I mean, you didn't have to spend, you know, pages and pages, but you would spend, you know, the chapter on the scripts, which like, yeah, I want to know, go behind the scenes of that. And you, you touch on, you get these interviews and ask these questions that I want to know about, you know, so you, you touched on a lot of things. You truly are a fan and I can see that in your writing, but you also, you know, have the experience and knowledge that the things that you need to share with people to get them to understand what the making of this film was all about. So I was going to ask you about this, that like, but you kind of answered it, but like, I was going to say, how do these chapters come about? Because you have chapters that feel like almost like an oral history was something I think Brian and I were trying to do and Brad Dukes did. And then you have another chapter that digs into these scripts and then you have interviews and then you share a lot of your own experience. And it does, I mean, you said you didn't know where it was going, but it felt like it was building onto something and you really got there to the end and you had the cherry on the top at the end there. And I really think you did an, a, an incredible job with this book. And I really, I think I've got almost every one of your books. Like I, I joke with you that I should be like, a, I should have like a, a book club of every time Scott <laughs> Ryan comes out with a book, <laughs> I have to make sure I have it. Cause I have your, your book on writing and stuff or publishing and stuff like that. And that's not a Twin Peaks book or your moonlighting book or there's so many books that i've gotten but this to me is my favorite of your books that you've written oh, and maybe you. I, i'm biased of course because it's twin peaks but it's a it's a great book i'm really impressed with it oh thank you so much i mean in some ways i feel like this is the first book i've written even though by the numbers it's my eighth book which is ridiculous mm. um but it's because there are interviews, of course, because I knew people were going to want that. But that is not the focus of this book. Where my other books, I've really tried to let the other people step up and tell the story of Moonlighting or Letterman or 30-something or whatever mm -hmm. we're working on. I always am going to interject because Lord knows I have opinions. Mm -hmm. But in this book, I really share things. And... If I wrote any of these chapters on a different day, I don't know if I would have again if I would have gotten there. Like the story of being in the UCD shop, you know, like should that story make the book? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that it should be in the book. But I think what I wanted to show people is how much Twin Peaks has infected my life. It goes everywhere with me, and even down to. Um, I forget what he was now, but the insurance person that comes to my house. Yeah. And then I learn 
that his aunt is in the movie or something. And right. like everywhere I go, it happens. Yeah. 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 You were like, okay, let's put it in. Let's check out where his house is, what the person's <laughs> house is. Um, and then you, you find out, world. you find out that that scene with, with Bobby and uh, Laura was not filmed in a basement, but a garage. Scott, there's so many nuggets that you have throughout this this book where he's like, oh, I, I've i known about Twin Peaks and Fire Rock Me for 30 years, but I didn't know about that. And that, that, that to me always excites me when there's something new that I hadn't known about. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I feel like there is things like that, like that, the fact that that's a garage. Now, on one hand, you could say like, who cares if that's mm -hmm. a garage? But if you're a lifelong Twin Peaks fan and you learn something that you didn't know, it's yeah. exciting. And um, I do feel like there is a lot in this book that has never been told before. And that excites me. But then there's also a lot of pure Scott nonsense <laughs> as well. I love the Scott nonsense. I and do too. Personal Twitter is at Scott Luck Story. And then there's also at Blue Rose Mag one for Twitter. And then on Instagram, I'm Blue Rose Mag. You can subscribe to the Blue Rose at bluerosemag.com. Pick up any of the books, either there or FayettevilleMafiaPress.com. And we have a lot of exciting books coming out, you know. And if you have ideas, let us know because we're always open to it. And it's a dream come true. I'm I'm very lucky and I know that this happens because your listeners support the work that we do and we really appreciate it. Where's the body? It's out back. Finally. Love you, babe. The darker chapter. My secret diary. Her page is missing. Before Laura Palmer's murder. Freak accident. <laughs> The killer will strike again. Who knows where or when? Twin Peaks. Fire. Walk with me. Rated R. Start the fire. I'm Emily Marinelli, and you're listening to the Twin Peaks Tattoo Podcast. I'm a professor of psychology, a psychotherapist, a writer on 25 Years Later website, and a huge Twin Peaks fan. I'm not a tattoo artist or tattoo expert by any means, but I'm a tattoo enthusiast and wanted to make a podcast combining two things I love the most. Each episode of the Twin Peaks Tattoo Podcast interviews someone about their Twin Peaks tattoo and explores what their ink means to them. Thanks for joining. And then there were the My Little Ponies. Now, these were the OG ones, way before Netflix made Friendship is Magic. These were the Saturday morning cartoon ponies that I loved so much. I had a My Little Pony lunchbox that held my very nutritious lunch, PB&J on Wonder Bread, an apple, a squeeze it, a Ziploc bag full of cheese balls, and the My Little Pony matching thermos warmed my Campbell's chicken noodle soup. Gobstoppers topped off the lunch meal and I was set. I owned maybe 20 My Little Ponies, many of them hand-me-downs with marker marks on them and other gross sticky gobs matting the pony hair. They all fit in a carrying case that was made to look like a stable. I carried them around everywhere, to the store, to my friends' houses, to family gatherings, to dance class, my traveling suitcase of plastic ponies. One day, I made the bold choice to take them to school, the whole stable. Sadly, it didn't fit in my locker, and my mom had already left after dropping me off, so I was stuck carrying them around all day and got strange looks from teachers and my classmates. I didn't care. The ponies gave me the courage to make it through my school day. They gave me protection, joy, and distraction. These objects I could count on. They got me through boring teachers, mean kids in the hallway, and being away from what I love the most. They connected me back to the show that made me feel safe. These transitional objects were a lifeline. The concept of transitional objects comes from Winnicott, who is a therapist who worked with kids. 
In his work, he discovered that as kids reach milestones in their growth, they need a link between a parent or a caretaker to the big scary outside world. In this way, objects can help children soothe the anxiety that happens when they're separated from their parents. So transitional objects like blankets or pacifiers or My Little Ponies symbolically replace the primary caretaker and provide a link between the caretaker and the outside world. I felt safe at home with my mom and my ponies on the screen. So if they could leap off the screen and into my portable stable, onto my lunchbox and thermos, I can take that sense of comfort with me wherever I am. If I can play with my dolls, my talk boy, and my color forms, and sleep in my strawberry shortcake nightgown, the world of pop culture objects can travel with me and help protect me in the big scary outside world. Think back to when you were a kid. What were some of your transitional objects? What are some of your transitional objects now? How do they make you feel safe? How do they bring you joy? As an adult, I have plenty of transitional objects. And as a huge Twin Peaks fan, like many of you listening, I have my own version of my My Little Ponies in a staple that connect me to the comfort of the Lynch Frost world. These include things like my Twin Peaks framed artwork, lots of Twin Peaks books, wearing my Double R Diner shirt as I teach a class on Twin Peaks and depth psychology, listening to Twin Peaks podcasts, and even making my own. You're an incredible prop collector and and also artist and musician. You're all the things, Vinny. But um, tell me a little bit about what being a Twin Peaks prop collector means for you. Uh, so for me, the kind of evergreen thing that I can always find a new uh, tidbit to appreciate is um, just the sets and the props and all of the kind of tangible things that uh, f- that flesh the fictional world out and uh, kind of the ways that those little things tie it to reality outside of the show. Yeah. So like, you know, you have the prop department making aesthetic choices and filling the sets with these mid-century pieces that are really, really cool Mm -hmm. uh, and create this specific atmosphere. But like, also you're like, Hey, my grandma had that. (laughs) And, (laughs) and you know, like so much of that, it was just like antique stuff that people collect and that's out there and available to find if you know what to look for. So that's kind of been my way to continue, continue appreciating the show. And, um, you know, keep finding something new to enjoy about it. Uh, it's very simple. I only have one Twin Peaks tattoo. It is the mark uh, that the log lady gets when she uh, disappears in the woods. Uh, so in season two, um, after Major Briggs comes back, uh, returns from his disappearance, he reveals that he's got this mysterious mark behind his ear uh, and he and the log lady meet with Agent Cooper to detail their experiences. And she uh, reveals this kind of burn type scar, maybe uh, on the back of her knee. That's uh, the two peaks um, joined together that uh, Cooper then draws on the chalkboard. Um, so I have it in the spot that the log lady has it uh in the color that the log lady has it it's pretty straightforward uh not really any uh artistic uh uh variation there but i it's to me it's you know you'd mentioned the idea of transitional objects and i think um for me this kind of fits in the same category where it's it's not an artistic take on something it's something from the show that uh, kind of crosses the line into uh, our world. When I first started getting tattooed or when I first started like trying to find my friendship or when I first got my friendship, um, it was a really um, 
you know, strange time in my life. I think I was really sad and there was just like a lot going on and, um, and I was extremely unhappy with myself and, um, and it was actually, so, uh, the person I apprenticed under, like he, he kind of saw to that, like we were just having like a really long conversation and we were just talking about life and, and just everything, like nothing too dramatic, but we were just like generally sharing um, and then he was just like, you're pretty nuts. And I was like, oh, cool. And he was like, yeah, you're pretty insane. I think you'd make a great tattooist. You know, like he really didn't even think about how, where I was at from an artistic point of view, um, which I really appreciated because there was that, that pressure of just like, oh, you must be a really amazing artist. And it's just like, you know what? Like I've met, I've met tattooers who are incredible at tattooing and terrible at painting. And then I've met really incredible painters that really could not tattoo. doesn't matter how often you've been trying to teach them. You know what I mean? And, and they are two separate things, even though they're kind of somewhat like, you know, another medium of art, but I think it just depends on where you take it from. Um, so I was kind of going through this whole like transition of just like, where am I at in my life? And I'm super utterly depressed and really like whatever. And, um, and he kind of just took this opportunity and he was like, you know, you know, if you're gonna, um, I mean, I guess I probably should just say it. Like I was, I was going through this terrible thing of just like, you know, a bit of self-harming, a bit of just kind of, you know, just a really dark place. Mm -hmm. And he turns around and he says, you know, if you're going to go and do something stupid, which I'm sure he didn't mean that in an offensive way, but he was just there like, you know, you should do something beautiful. Mm -hmm. So he was like, all right, I'm going to show you how that. to how to tattoo you know and uh and so when I first started I actually did um like non non-machine it was just all like hand poked tattoos um he also believed that you know if, if the world should end you should be able to work no matter what hence why he was like you can learn tattoo without machines so I was like all right great um and I still enjoy tattooing like that I kind of treat it as like a fun party trick you know if someone wants to get something done just by hand I'm like yeah right, I could do that it's good um it is incredibly therapeutic and so I, I, you know, I started tattooing essentially as a way of healing, which is really good. Um, and then when I started studying a lot about tribes and, you know, black work and things like that, um, there's uh, one tribe from, you know, way back when in Taiwan, I think. Um, maybe it wasn't Taiwan. I'll have to rethink that, but I'll send you the link. But like, uh, it's it tells a really great story that um, so in this culture, it's like, if you are sick and you're kind of like near dying, they would get the witch doctor, the witch doctor to come and she would tattoo that person as a form of healing. And wow. uh, if that person healed and survived, they would then apprentice and become the next, the next witch doctor that would learn to tattoo, you know? Oh. And I just kind of thought that that was like such a moving thing, you know? And I just thought, okay, well, here I am. Like I've learned, I've been lucky enough to have an apprenticeship to learn to tattoo. And, um, and I'm very, very big on propane therapy. Like, it's not like I tell the world that, but you know, if my friends or if anyone I know is having a really terrible day, I'm just there like, just come get tattooed. You know, you'd be amazed at, at what you can sit through and where you can channel your emotions. Do you have any Twin Peaks tattoos? I do. Yes. I Tell only us what have they are. small ones. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have. Um, so I have the, the owl cave, which is right there. Nice. Yeah. Uh, on your on finger. Same, yeah. It's on the it's on the same ring finger in Fire Walk With Me. Nice. Um, you know, is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? Which way it should face? Um, I haven't actually got more than that thinking about it only because I am extremely covered and I, I am kind of stuck for space, really. So it's like we're all just trying to figure out where to fit things. Um, but I am lucky enough that I get to tattoo great Twin Peaks tattoos on other people. And that makes me very, very happy. Thank you, Emily, for sending in that clip of your show, Twin Peaks Tattoo Podcast. We really appreciate it. Like I said before, please subscribe to her show. It's a monthly show. It's fantastic. You won't regret it. And thank you, Scott Ryan, for being on our show in the middle of the year with your fantastic book. 
yeah. highly recommend all the links from the show notes please get your copy today it's a fantastic read uh ben before we end today's show let's talk more about the convention you went to back in october yeah, Spooky Empire. That was pretty cool in Orlando, Florida there. I went. Yeah, I mean, it was such a big Twin Peaks event. You know, this this convention I went to is like the second biggest convention hall in the country. Oh, and wow. it's like, I feel like I was walking a mile. Like, first I had to make sure my Uber drove in the right area of the <laughs> of the whole building. They were, I, I, somebody was saying to me that it would take like a half hour if you were like in the wrong place. Like that you had to make sure you drove on the right side of the hall to drop you off. And then you wow. get in there and you're just like walking, walking, walking. It's like I almost got lost <laughs> looking for the event. But it's it was really cool. It was cool, like I said, to see uh, Twin Peaks friends and just to see there was like 14 Twin Peaks actors. There was Dana Ashbrook and there's, there's Robin Livy. And of course, Kyle McLaughlin and Sherilyn Fenn and Sherry Lee and uh, Ray Wise. And, and there was just so many of them to see. And I mean, I would never met Her- Harry Goez. And so I got to have a picture with him. There, there was the VIP uh, event. So w- they actually mingled. They actually came up to people and we got to see wow. each other. And it was really kind of neat to see all these people here. It was such a good time. I mean, that's awesome. Ben, you were so nice. You were sending me photos that whole weekend. I saved them all. <laughs> I don't know if I was nice or cruel that I was like sending you pictures. This is what I took out of it. I was so happy for you. Yeah. I was so happy for you. Yeah, of course. Did I want to be there? Sure. But yes. obviously I'm happy for you that you got to meet these people. And some of these folks like Kyle, like Carrie Goaz, uh, they do not go to these things very often. No, right? Yeah. I mean, Kyle McLaughlin is probably the biggest one that he doesn't attend these type of events. At least in the last 30 years, he really hadn't been attending. It's only recently that I think he's gone to a few now. So that's really something. Uh, the actors who play Sandy and Mandy, uh, Giselle and Andrea there. I mm. got a picture with them, which is yes. kind of cool. And I yep. know that uh, Amy was around there, Candy, but I didn't get a picture with her. But it was kind of cool just to have them a part of it and stuff. It was a good. It was such a fun time to be around the people and like I said and we were saying before it had been a couple years since I've really been able to hang out with people and to be able to hang out with some of these friends and just catch up with Aaron Cohen and catch up with Stephen Miller and James Ellis and I just chatting about Twin Peaks for over an hour I think some people were kind of like you know they've been talking a long time (laughs) James I mean um we talk on uh DMs all the time oh yeah he's a cool guy real cool guy that's what it's about. And I hope they do more of these events. And I hope we can do some of these events that are maybe closer to us in the Boston area, maybe the New York area. It'd be nice to have more of these events. But uh, Right. Maybe even Hartford time. in 2023. Maybe. Yeah. But that's awesome. I'm so happy you got to go, Ben. And it was great to see all the photos afterwards. Stephen yeah. Miller got a great group photo of the fans. And then I, I got to be part of the, the group photo of, I don't know if there was 14. There was probably at least 10, uh, 10 Twin Peaks actors, which is still like, yeah. when you think of it, how how often do you get to have a big group picture with with the cast of Twin Peaks? It was, it's, it's pretty cool. You were so lucky to actually be able to record the Q&A, which we put out last month, and that's amazing too. Yeah, it was so cool. I mean, I it, you always worry about having good audio, and like mm. I could probably have done it with my phone, but it was great that I could bring the recorder, and people at Spooky uh, Empire were very kind to let me use their, kind of connect into their board. So that was really cool. So I, yeah, I recommend if you haven't heard it, go check out last uh, month's show. Or, you know, Stephen Miller, he video recorded it and he's got his YouTube channel. So I would go to Steve Miller's uh, channel and check out the video. That is awesome. The next time we will be back, part two of the best of Twin Peaks in 2022 will be airing January 2nd. We're taking a week off. We are going to end that show with our never before heard audio of us trying to talk to Kimberly Ann Cole. This gives you a whole week to go to the Red Room podcast and listen to Scott Ryan's interview with Kimberly Ann Cole, because it will give you a little bit more context of what you're about to hear next week. And I will leave you with a little teaser, and we'll see you guys in two weeks. Um, Nobody's talked to you about this in all these years? No. That seems crazy to me. Like, people would want to meet you so badly. Mm -hmm. Who's calling? It's someone Um, else. They're trying to scoop me. I'm being scooped. I'm, 
I'm gonna hold and accept. Hey, Kimberly, it's Ben. And Brian. From Twin Peaks Unwrapped. <laughs>